Hello and welcome to Fueling Around with me, Jason Plato, and the chalk to my Q-tip <laughs> is Dave Vitti. <laughs> Hello, mate. How are you? Oh, that's a lovely line, isn't it? Well, you know, like we try and tailor it to the guest in hand, <laughs> and I thought, well, what else can I be? I must be the chalk to your Q-tip. Oh, so we'll I go with that. It sounds slightly wrong, but I think we can get away with it just about. I like it. I like it a lot. Now, Fueling Around is powered by Adrian Flux. As the UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help save you money on your bike, your car or even your home insurance. So then, Dave, what's been going on? The sun's out for the first time in a couple of days. The pubs are open. Indeed. Sun's out, guns out. The time that we record this and you're allowed to go out for dinner again and you're allowed to go to the pub, which is quite exciting. So, uh, yeah, it's just nice to have the world that we know getting back to normal slowly, isn't it? Well, fingers crossed it keeps going in, in that direction. Eh? Right, so today our guest is quite simply a sporting legend. And when I say a sporting legend, I'm talking old school. A sportsman with real character and quite possibly, in fact, it's not quite possibly, in my opinion, he is the most naturally talented professional in the game of snooker that this country has ever produced. It is, of course, the one and only Ronnie O'Sullivan. Hello, pal. How are you? How you doing, mate? You all right? Yeah, I don't think that intro's strong enough, actually, for you. Oh, it's a bit heavy, that one. A bit, bit of pressure there, mate. No, no, not at all. Not at all. I think it's all true. I genuinely do. It's uh, We both think it's true. Both big fans, and uh, and it's a pleasure to have you on the show, Ronnie. Yeah, no, nice to be on the show. Nice to be on the show. Love my cars. Well, we did a bit of work together to, um, at f- Fifth Gear. Yeah, I loved it, mate. It's fantastic. Yeah, good old days. Good old days. So, mate, what have you been up to? Uh, to be honest with you, I've just got back into my fitness, like, last... Last March, uh, I was like a week into sitting on the sofa mm. and thinking, this could, this could go either two ways. I could end up <laughs> obese and having to lose seven stone in a, in a two years' time, or I can get myself really fit and, uh, and come out and, and, and enjoy this, whatever, however long we're going to be locked down for. And I chose the healthier option because... You know, uh, I could go both ways, and I didn't fancy the first option, which was uh, eating myself to death and just moulding into the into my sofa. <laughs> I suppose it's uh, it's enviable what you've done, and you're in the minority, I think, because I think most people, when lockdown happened last year, went down the route of just thinking, "I'm just going to eat, and I'm just going to drink, mm. and I'm just going to stay at home." Mm. And actually, what they would then do, which is probably what I did, is you get to the point where you just think, "God, I'm just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. My jeans don't mm. fit me, my shirts don't fit me," and then you do it. But actually. To have taken that tack from the first off, there's a lot of foresight, I think, in that. Well, I've done what you've done for about six years uh, <laughs> before when I was younger. <laughs> I did the lockdown. I was just, I was just out, of, you know, just hammering it for six years. So I, I kind of knew where it could go from from past experiences, and I thought, let's try and preempt that and be a bit more proactive and yeah. uh, try not go down that road. So um, yeah, listen, I, I know it's tough, but uh, I, I knew the two options, like. Within a week, within a week of being on that sofa and watching Sky News for 24 hours a day, I was like, oh, this could turn out awful. So, Dave, um, you've let something out the bag there, because in all the little chats, you've never disclosed that you put a bit of timber on last year. I did, and do you know what? It was more recently. It wasn't a last year thing. I got to the point, I had to do a podcast, and it was a visual podcast, and it was earlier on this year. I think it was in about February. And I just remember seeing myself on this screen with a whole load of other people, and I just thought... God, you look huge. You look really bloated and just... Ugh. So that was it. I thought, right, beginning of February, I'm going to do something about this. And I got out on my bike and I stopped eating crap every day and put down the crisps and the... Ch- the, the problem is when you're working from home, you're far too close to the biscuit tin. That's my biggest problem. And so I thought I'd cut all that out and then I've lost about a stone and a half. Lovely. Since February. Good on you. You know, and I feel better for it. Yeah. Aside from fitness then, Ronnie, sort of last year, for example, yeah. how do you keep yourself occupied other than going to the gym? How do you find that you just don't go stir crazy rattling around at home for, for months on end? Because uh, I work so hard, I kind of don't give myself a hard time if I actually do nothing because, you know, mm. um, you know I'm so busy like practicing, um, you know, doing some different projects with, with my management and stuff like that. And, you know, like I said, I've got my keep fit, my running, I've got you know, yeah. kids and partner and spend time with them so i don't actually get a lot of downtime but if i do i just kind of just make the most of it really so i suppose in a way like my friend said it's just like let's just try and distract ourselves for as long as we can by just into work into keep it into whatever it is you want to do mm. and um you know just just try and 
you know, because I'm fighting if I stop, I won't start again, you know, so it's yeah. kind of easier just to, I, I took the Floyd Mayweather approach, I remember years ago he kind of, he had a fight and then got out of shape and then he said he found it really hard to get back in shape, so he said, well, I'm just staying in shape to the end of my career and I kind of mm. thought, you know what, it's probably a lot easier um, yeah. if, if you take that approach because, yeah. you know, once you take some time out, I don't know about you, Jason, but, you know, it's really hard to motivate yourself to want to get going again, so... You know, and uh, sometimes I've had to, 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 to hire someone to come and live with me for a week just to make me get <laughs> cheer because I've taken so much time off and I'm just like, I just don't want to face having to go in and have to, to get back in the grind, you know? It makes you think about people like Ricky Hatton and the way that he used to, I mean, I know obviously a completely different sport to either of you two, but the way that he used to either be in training mode or very much not in training yeah, mode, yeah. you know, there was no kind of constant thing whereby he would always keep himself at a certain level. When he wasn't in training mode, he went for it. And then can you imagine getting that point where you start on a Monday morning and think, oh. I've got to shift about three stone here. Yeah, hard work. Mm. I think you're right, Ronnie. Best to just keep it, keep the pan on the boil. Or on the sis, Emma, rather than letting it go cold and have to get the thing <laughs> cooked up again. Yeah, it's easy to go to a simmer to a to a boil than like pure cold to a, to a, to a boil. If that makes sense, you know what I'm saying? That gap to to, to breach is a lot easier. Um, Ronnie, talk to us about cars. Then, obviously, we know that you're a big petrol head. Where did it all start for you? What are your early childhood car memories? I think it started. Like, uh, my dad tells the story. He said that we used to have a mini. He said. And, he said one day, so I looked out the window and you were sitting in the mini. He was only about five or six trying to sort of start the car up. So <laughs> I, think, I, I think from an early age, I always had this desire to get behind the wheel. Do you remember the whole process of driving lessons and passing your tests and exactly what that felt like, Ronnie? Yeah, no, I remember that really well. Uh, I was just so eager to get my driving license and I'd, I'd done what, like one of them intense courses. So. Yeah. Every day for a week, however long it was, the guy would pick me up, would do our stuff, and he went, you're going to pass, you're going to pass, blah, 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 blah. So I was like, fine. we go to the test, and it gets cancelled. And I oh. was devastated. I was like, oh. You know, because I'd already bought my car. I thought, right, I bought the car. Mm. But when I pass my test, I'm literally like in that car, and I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And what was it? What was it? What did you buy? Um, I bought a 318. I, it was a black BMW, and I yeah. paid seven thousand pounds for it, and cool. the insurance was more than the car, so I ended yeah. up paying seven thousand two hundred insurance, and I was like, how can that be right? But I didn't care at the time. I was like, I just, I just need some wheels, you know. Um, in hindsight, I probably would have gone for something um, a little bit less, a bit less leery. Yeah, you should have gone to Adrian Flux, mate, for your insurance. <laughs> Obs. It's been like seven grand, like more money on the insurance card. Never dream of doing that now. But at the time, you can't just think, I just want it. I've got to have yeah. it. And did you pass first time? Yeah, I passed first time, yeah. I didn't think I would, though, because I, I made a mistake. And I was like, he's going to tell me on that. <laughs> How about you, Dave? Yeah, no, first time. First time. Yeah. And, um, and I was worried that... I might be a little bit too confident because I think like all of us, I'd done a bit of driving beforehand. Yeah. You know, I'd driven in car parks with my dad. I'd driven on farms with mates. I'd, yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. done quite a lot of stuff behind a wheel sort of at the age of 12, 13, 14. So therefore there's, there's a danger though that sometimes that can work against you in a test situation mm. where actually you think you know it too much and you're overconfident, but actually I managed to get through. I still remember to this day passing my test and a mate of mine came and picked me up and his 1.1 popular plus Fiesta. And he goes, there you go, you can drive home. I'm not entirely sure how that works in terms of the insurance, but let's sort of skip over that for a second. Yeah, but he yeah. kind of said, you can drive home. And I just thought, this just feels magical. Here I am, I'm actually out on the road. I'm not in a lesson and I'm street legal. And it was just such a feeling of freedom. It's amazing. Yeah. Third time for me. Third? Yeah. Wow. And um, do you think that was overconfidence? Uh, but the first one absolutely definitely was, yeah. Was that the power slide in that 80-mile <laughs> around the roundabout? A little bit heel and toe on a down change. But the bloke <laughs> says, I mean, literally, the bloke, I can remember him saying, no, no. So, and I said, mate, are you, are, you, are, you, are you mad? And he said, no, no, you're too confident. You know, you'll have to wait another month. Yeah. And then the next yeah. one, I was too nervous because yeah. I didn't want to fail again. So he was teaching you a lesson, was he? Yeah, he was actually, yeah. He was. Hypothetically and literally. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, you know, I remember that. I remember, the, you know, the great day, wasn't it, when we got our licences and we had a car mm. to go out and drive. Brilliant days. 
So what followed the uh, the black BMW then, Ronnie? Uh, after that, I kind of got a bit sensible and I, I got given a sponsored car, so I didn't have to worry about buying or paying for the insurance. And that was a two two one six Rover. Oh, that right? that's a stinker of a motor, isn't it? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, it wasn't great, but you know, for me, I was like, cause the BMW was quite old, but the BMW, I thought that's okay, and then. This one was kind of newer car, but it obviously wasn't such a high performance sort of flashy car. I had some fun in it, you know. I was like up curbs, you there, and I didn't really care because it wasn't mine either. So I, like, I didn't really give a monkey, you know. When I give it back, they must have given it a look it over and going, never giving him another car. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? I, I, I've had that. I've had people look at me like that before. Just a couple uh, of times. <laughs> Jason, I'd, I'd never want a car back after you've had it, mate. I'd be no. Car with you, mate. Oh, yeah, they, they do have a hard time. But that's what they say when they, when like, because I, I, I love driving, I love my track driving, and I, I like to, like, give the car a bit of stick, give them the right sort of roads and time and wherever you are. And I just sometimes think, oh, pity the guy that's going to have to buy this car off of me, you know? <laughs> 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 They've all been abused. So, BMW, 212 Rover. Yeah. When did the first, like, proper sexy thing come along? Oh, well, sexy for me, it was a, it was a new new model, 325i Cabriolet. Oh, and nice. I think I paid, I think I paid about 25000 So it was probably about six months old when I bought it. Yeah. But it was like my dream car, three series, mm, convertible, yeah. top of the range, two, two and a half litre. And I was like, you know, it, was, it had... Um, it was a blue colour. can't remember the name of the blue. Um, and it had uh, like light grey leather. Oh, I, just, oh, I just couldn't believe it. it yeah. Was just, yeah, it was just... I thought I, well, I felt like I made it then, you know? And what age are you then, Ronnie? Uh, I was probably 18 at the time. Oh, OK. 18, wow. yeah. Great car. Yeah, and then from then, I was kind of hooked on BMW, so I went to... to eventually, went to, like, the M3. So mm-hmm. I had about two or three M3s after that, but they were just a phenomenal car. The M3, I just remember thinking, wow, this is just on another level, you know? Yeah. Do you know what? That that actually, to go from a, you know, your car journey to end up quick, relatively quickly in M3, I mean, that, you know, that that was my that was my dream car when I was a kid in M3. Mm. Oh, in fact, not, not, not even a kid, actually. Still is mine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's a car you always lost after. Yeah. That was a great car. It was fantastic. And did you keep it on the island or did you spit it off at all? Because uh, they're a bit lively on the rear, weren't they? Yeah, the rear yeah, it was fine. It was actually okay. I never, ever had a, had an accident in, in the M3. I, I did have an accident in my in my 325 wire once, but that was, I was, just, that was just crazy. I was only young and we was in Blackport at the time. And I remember it, it was in the hotel drive. And I kind of just picked up speed. Uh, and I didn't realise there was like these speed humps, and I just kind of just took off basically. And I was just in, <laughs> I was just in mid, mid-air, and I could just see this hotel in front of me. I can't remember what it was called. Big roundabout with a big sign, welcome to, I think it's called the village or something, and I just remember just ploughing straight into it. And I, and, I, and I kind of got out, and I looked at the car, and I just thought, Jesus Christ, what's happened here? My wheels, I couldn't see them. They kind of like buckled underneath the car. And there was just smoke coming out of it. And I just went, right, you know, and I just got in the hotel and the police came and whatever, you know, I just, like, just as long as no one was hurt. But that was the only, um, it was quite weird. Yeah, I never had no accents in the M3, but I did in the, the 325i. So maybe that was why I didn't have an accent in the M3. I can kind of realise you've got, got to yeah. be a bit careful. That, that was a long wait to get that car back as well. I think it was about 15 weeks and I was... Uh, and as it happens, I ended up smashing up the hired car as well. <laughs> 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 they gave me a hired car. I ended up having an accident in that as well. So, oh, yeah, it was crazy, you know. Just not a safe driver at that time. But I am now, and there's a story to tell as well about why I've become a better driver as well. So, Oh, oh go on, then. I think that cues it up perfectly. Well, because like, I kept losing my licence and uh, through speeding. So I lost it about three times, I think. You know, for, for going quite fast as well. The, the best one was, um, I think I was on the motorway coming back from Bournemouth, and uh, I was doing about 110, something like that. Not too, not going too mad. This is about one o'clock in the morning. I just got beat, and as I'm driving through, I, I'm the, I'm the, I could, I, there was a bridge going above the motorway, and, I, mm. and as I'm going through, I just seen the car pull off, and I thought that's <sighs> got to be the police. Yeah. So I thought I thought I'm screwed now, so I just might as well just go. 
and this I was in the M3, so I put my foot down and I went woof, and I just thought I'll, I'll try and come off at a, a, the next exit and just kind of just pull over somewhere, <laughs> just ch ch chill out for a bit and just pretend like you know that, that nothing's happened. So anyway, I'm going, I'm going, and I can see this car behind, sort of like trying to sort of keep up with me. And as I as I kind of forward, there was two. In front of me, there was two police cars that just basically blocked the motorway off. Oh, you're joking. <laughs> well, proper roadblock. Yeah, so I thought, I'm done here. I thought, no, I can't, you know, there's no point trying to get past these two. They're not shooting me. So I pulled over and, and the guy got out of the car and he said, he said, we were doing like 140 or whatever it was. Uh, and he was getting away from us. I said, oh to be honest with officer, I said, I said, I've only just got the car. So, you know, I didn't realise the speed that these things do. I said, you know, and... Uh, Anyway, I, I kind of half tried to bribe him with some tickets to do bribe. To do, <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? I was sat here thinking to myself, I wonder if I wonder if he's pulled a stunt with like a, a cue in the back yeah, or I something. Yeah, I tried, I tried. I thought, I'm done now. I thought, I'm all in. So I've got to try and pull, pull any trick I can. And uh, he was like, listen, he said, I can't. He said, he said the helicopter's been called out. And <gasps> said, you know, we've, we've got to kind of do that. <laughs> Do what we got to do, and he was feeling my tires as well. I remember him feeling the tires, and he went quad air up, and then the engine. He was like, they pulled oh my that God. up, so they knew, you know. And I went anyway. Listen, I'll, they they done me at an average of about 133 mile an hour. So <sighs> it, it was, I was going a lot faster than that. So you, you were thinking, I'll take that. To be honest with you, weren't you? Yeah, well, I got, I got a year ban. I deserved it. You know, I was like 20 at the time, and just, yeah. yeah, just lost a smooth ride. I just wanted to get home, you know. And they, the roads were empty. So, so anyway, yeah, that, that, that kind of forwarded on. So I had a few of them, maybe three of them, and then uh, my <laughs> mate said to me, he said, look, he said, you're, you're forever going to be losing your licence. He said, I know you like your cars. I said, yeah. But, right, go go on this driving course. The guy's name was John. John Lyons, his name was, and basically trained the police, the, the you know, the ones that... Yeah, uh, pursuit drivers. You know, like an advanced the, driving the, course. Yeah. Advanced, yeah, 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 yeah. So he trains all them. So he said, go and have two days with him. So we'd start at eight in the morning and finish at six at night. After the first day, I was exhausted. You know, because the, every, you know, he's just basically just retraining you. So you kind yeah, of have yeah. to unlearn everything that you thought yeah. was right. In the end, he had me looking under cars. So I'm driving down a side street and saying, look under the cars just in case you can see some feet. <laughs> you know? So like yeah. whereas before I just I just fly down this side yeah. street. He's like, no, there could be someone there. Da, da, da. So he kind of like brings to life all the different sort of you know you know you just got to be just wary oh, yeah. that there's, there's pedestrians about. And and I had two days with him, and since then I've never had a point in my life, and and I'm much more respectful of what a car can do. And, oh, that's cool, isn't it? Yeah, and and, and I'll be honest, it's the best thing I've ever done. Yeah. Because you can still have your fun, but you just yes. have to pick and choose. And mm. the best bit of knowledge you gave me was, you said, you, you said, we might be driving in a 60, but it's all about linking speed with vision. He said, so yeah. if you can't see around that bend, there's no point doing 60. He said, you've got to be able to stop just in case yeah. someone's coming around the other side yeah. and he's out of control. So you can avoid the accident. Mm. Yeah. So I was like, okay, so I'm, I'm so much more, I'm a safe, a lot safer driver. I've had got no points. And it's, you know, it's, it's important, you know, because they are, they're, they're, they're dangerous tools, a car, you know, in, in the wrong hand. Absolutely. And do you know what? How on tune is this, Dave? Because we were speaking about this yesterday, we're, 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 mm. you know, my two girls are 11 and 13, and it won't be long before they're going to want to start driving. But, yeah, I'm, I'm probably not the best example, <laughs> you, know, you know, drive like dads. So I'm, I'm now starting to think, oh, my God, you know, th th that moment's going to arrive in no time. I, I might mm. get you to come around and have a chat, chat with my girls, Ronnie, right, because right, I'm going to drive slower now, having talked to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, do you know what? I actually have more fun driving now because I feel a lot safer. I feel like I'm yeah. not putting anyone in danger. And there are certain roads where we went, look, you said, these are B roads. You said, there's no one out here. He said, yeah. as long as it's a straight road and whatever, yeah. you know, you're not. there's no speed cameras. You can have a bit of fun. Yeah, so yeah. it's kind of like choosing the right places to do it. So, yeah, no, listen, it was the best thing I've ever done, you know. Have you got a clean licence, Dave? Yes, I have. I have currently. I've had points in the past. I think I've been up to six before at one point. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I'm all clean at the minute and have been for a good few years. Uh, Ronnie, in terms of now, and obviously you being a, a safe and educated driver, what's uh, on the O'Sullivan Rocket Drive at the minute? Right, at the moment, I've got the R8 V10, uh, whatever it is, supercharged. Yeah. So I love that car. I just love that car. And I think last time I see you, Jason, I, I had it there. Yeah, you were in it, yeah. Lovely car. You had the Pulse Turbo at the time and... Yeah. Uh, 
you know, I know the Porsche is is it is it more of a driver's type of car because you get the back end out, but I, for me, it just felt a little bit like a little bit small inside. Whereas the R8, I just feel like I'm much more space, a bit more mm-hmm. like being in a in a Bentley if you like inside. But the performance of it for me, it just sort of like I get a lot of fun out of it, you know. So I've I've had them for probably like the last I don't know t- ten twelve years. I've had an R8 every year. I've always had one. Fabulous um, engine. Ah, oh, it just feels the noise in the yeah. yeah it's just such a just such a great car. Yeah. Do you know what it was like? Was it oh, not last year? Year before, I did uh, a, a review on the new R8 V10, and there was some yeah. really sad news which came with that. Um, that yeah, that review and that and that is they're not going to make any more. I know. And such a shame because that that V10 is just the most glorious engine. Well, I've told them at Audi. I said, look, when the very last R8 V10 you're making, I want it. So because I know they're not making it no more, and I yeah. just thought I just was like, you know, I'll get I'll get what I can out of it, and then obviously try and oh, hang on to it. Yeah, obviously it's only a two seat. So I've always because I travel a lot and you know kids and blah blah blah. I've always had a four seater. So as well, um, well, and I had it for the last seven eight years now. I've had an RS4. Event. Yeah, yeah, that's a cracker. That's kind of like, yeah, it's like my everyday car. So it's got like eighty thousand miles on it. Nearly sold it last year for a C forty three, um, but then COVID hit, cancelled it, and then my mate said, "Why are you selling that for that?" And I went, "You know what? You're right. I cleaned it up. It looked nice. It was like a brand new car, and uh, I cancelled the C forty three, and I've still got the RS four uh, V eight. Great engine, good yeah. car." Yeah, you can't go wrong with them. I mean, they're fantastic, aren't they? You know, it's, it's too good to sell in, in a way. You know, it's too good to sell. Yeah. Do you find you get attached to cars long term, Ronnie? Do you find that when you find something that you really like, like the RS4 and like the R8, that you just, you've got no desire to change them? No, I, I used to change my R8 every year. I'd go like every year, brand new one, every year. That's because that's okay. what my dad used to do. And I'm, I'm not sure that's probably a good thing to do, but I just kind of like, it's, just, it's what you grow up seeing, I suppose. Yeah. And you just kind of think it's normal every year, every August the 1st, new reg. You know, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> get a new car. Yeah. Uh, but then I kind of like, I just thought a couple of times, I, you know, the worst thing I'd done was I, I sold a 500 SL and I had it for two years and loved it. Mm. bought an SL55 and hated yeah. it and I paid double the money I sold the yeah. SL for 50 bought the, S, uh, bought the 55 for about 110 and hated it and I thought yeah. what have I done I've just paid double for a car that I, I don't really <laughs> like it, was, it, was, it kind of felt a bit overpowered so yeah. I kind of thought you know unless I'm 100% sure that by getting rid of this car that the replacement is going to be better then just don't do it you know yeah, um, yeah. so you know you know, I'm, I'm, yeah that, that's kind of like the mindset me now when it, when it comes to cars well do you know what that kind of answers my next question which was going to be you know if you had to pick one car and stick with it for the rest of your life i guess it would be be the the, the r8 v10 eh? well yeah it's obviously not an everyday it's quite a selfish kind of car because it's only two seat two seater so how practical that would be when you've still got children i don't know but if i could choose <laughs> my favorite car that i've ever had i would definitely say it would be the r8 uh, v10 um but if i had to go for a ford Four seater. I think my best four seater um, four door would have would have been would, would have been the M3 because I think that's a kind of yeah. good compromise. Right. And when I spoke to you, Jason and, and Tiff at that fifth year day, I was like, I said, well, you've got Audi, Merck, and BMs. I said, like, you're you're obviously the the drivers here. You know more about cars than I could ever dream of knowing. And you kind of said to me, BM first, Merck second, Audi third. And that's that's because you're a driver. You're coming mm. from that perspective. So. I kind of that's always stuck in my mind that you know if, if ever I had to get uh, an everyday car, probably the M3 would be the type of car to go for. I think you're right. I think you're right, and I think I'd be in agreement. Unless you've changed your mind, Jason. Since no, like well, do you, do, you, do you know what? Yeah, I mean, it's a great. They're great bits of kit, aren't they? I mean, in fact, any German car, to yeah, be honest, they I make the best so. cars in the world. What's the new? Uh, the, 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 there's one car at the moment, and my friend has got it's the electric Porsche, and it's a four door, but it looks like a 911. Yeah, it's called a Taycan. It it is extraordinary. Is it? It is absolutely phenomenal. The quickest thing, I, the quickest road car I've ever driven. Oh, okay, wow, wow. It's ridiculous. 
definitely speak to your local Porsche de- deal and go for a te- test drive because they are phenomenal. Mm. Ronnie, before we let you go, uh, our final question for myself and JP is the fact that we've always said that music and cars go very well together, we think. So we need your fantasy drive. Where are you? Where are you going? What are you listening to? And most importantly, what are you driving? Yeah. Right, I'm driving the R8 V10. Um, I'm probably up in Peak District. Yep, nice. I'm going across the Snake Pass. Mm. So I'm going from Sheffield to Manchester. Yep. Oh, that's a great and... road. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, that is a belting road. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate, that is just sensational. I've got a friend that lives in the Peaks, and whenever I'm on Sheffield, I'm like, I just, like, I just love making that journey. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's just incredible. And then I'm probably listening to a bit of print. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, maybe a bit of print, a bit of Tupac. Like it. Mate, That that is one of the all-time classic roads. It's mega. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I know people that are not confident. They're, they're confident drivers, but I send them across the snake path. and like, oh, please don't send me that way again. And I, and I get that. <laughs> you can look down and think... If this goes wrong, I'm going off the side of a mountain. But you know, that, that's what makes it. E- that's what makes it even more exciting for me. You know, it's just sort of like the twist and the bends and the, and just like you know, it, it calls on a bit, a, a little bit of driving skill. You know. Oh, definitely, and also you can see you can see through the corners, can't you? You know, when you're coming yeah. down some of the passes, you just know there's nothing there because mm. you can see yeah. it over and atop. And oh, it's fantastic, mm. isn't it? I'm thinking six o'clock in the morning, sun's just coming up, no one's on yeah. the roads. Oh. Yeah, beautiful. Amazing, yeah. yeah, perfect. I think on that note, Jason, you need to take us out. Right, that's it for this episode of Fueling Around, powered by Adrian Flux. As the UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help you save money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. Thanks to you, Dave, as always. And a huge thanks to our special guest this week, the one and only Mr. Ronnie O'Sullivan. Uh, thanks, JP. It's been great to chat and always a pleasure, mate. Always a pleasure. Cheers, buddy. Absolutely. Superb to have you on, Ronnie. Don't forget, you can get in touch with us on Twitter at Jason Plato or at David Vitti. And if you liked what you've heard today, feel free to give us a five star rating, press the subscribe button, and share the podcast on all your socials. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Ta da!